Hi everybody. Thank you for all coming back. This is great. Um, so tonight, um, as Dr. Grill mentioned, we're going to be focusing on medications for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there's a little bit about us again, and um, especially on this uh, topic, we'd like to mention that we have no financial disclosures related to any of the products that we'll be talking about. So. Um, Many of you then know that this is a quarterly series, and this <clears throat> is the second uh, this year. Um, the first was an overview of um, de the various types of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, and frontotemporal um, dementia. Today's session is going to focus on helping you understand the current medications available for Alzheimer's disease and how to use them, as well as um, the direction that science is moving uh, to identify new treatments. I'm going to pull this a little bit because I feel like I'm turning my back to half the room, so I don't want to do that. The third session will um, be very practical. Um, it's about the challenges that um, you face on a day-to-day -day basis if you're caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. Um, how to respond to behaviors, how to communicate effectively, and some of the resources that might benefit you in the community, such as those that are represented here today. And the fourth session, which rolls around in November, is going to focus on how we reduce our risk for Alzheimer's disease, both medical risks and lifestyle um, risks. Uh, I should mention that um, the presentations are videotaped, and if you happen to miss one of the sessions, you can actually go to the UCI Mind website and hear um, the sessions. I think we'll also mention that w every time we do these presentations, we ask for feedback. And a lot of you mention about how you would like color images of the slides. And we would love to provide it to you, but it just would uh, break our budgets. So what we do is you can actually access the slides on the website. And also, if you call us, we'll be happy to send you a PDF of the slides. Okay. All righty. So Malcolm just eliminated that from the evaluation forms, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what he was trying to get at. All right. Now, most of you have heard me explain the difference between uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and cognitive impairment then, since most of you have been here before. But there are a few people that haven't, so I think it's good for us to always refresh our memory about what these terms mean. So dementia is a, a global umbrella term that refers uh, to a group of sy symptoms. It's considered a syndrome. It involves three primary symptoms, the first being a change in intellectual ability or decline in intellectual ability, the second being that it affects your memory plus one or more other cognitive abilities. So that might be like your language abilities, reasoning, judgment, decision making, planning, organizing. And the third is that the impairment is so bad that it interferes with your ability to do your everyday living skills. And here we're talking about things like dressing yourself, bathing yourself. So this is an umbrella term. and. Um, a good analogy is cancer because cancer is a big umbrella term and there are many types of cancers. We might think about uh, prostate cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, long, long laundry list of cancers. Well, the same thing with dementia. It's a big umbrella term characterized by these three features and there are many different types. Alzheimer's disease, like the slide says, just happens to be the very most common type, but there are other types of dementias or causes of dementia um, that we're going to show you in just a moment. And then there's a transition state between what we consider normal cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease. And that transitional state is called mild cognitive impairment. It's when we start to see some changes, but the person is still able to function in their everyday life. 
So um, this slide represents that process in a little bit more detail. Um, actually, the very first thing we want to mention is that Alzheimer's disease begins before you actually ever see any symptoms. So in other words, there are changes taking place in your body related to Alzheimer's disease, biological changes that happen for 15, 20 or more years before you ever see the first uh, what we call clinical symptom. Um, so you, the person might feel like their memory is not as good as it used to be, but when we test them on cognitive tests, they're still functioning normally. Then, if uh, these biological changes progress, um, we'll talk more about these changes that are happening in the brain in just a moment. If they continue to progress and more accumulate uh, more, then you start to see outward symptoms. You start to see clinical symptoms where the person is starting to have difficulties. So where originally the person might have been a little concerned, now um, it's noticeable to family or friends. So perhaps the person's missing appointments frequently. Um, and the uh, impact can be just on memory or can also affect other cognitive abilities, such as those I mentioned a moment ago. But the person's not considered to have dementia yet because they're still able to function normally in their everyday life. They're still able to take care of their everyday living needs. Um, and again, if uh, these brain changes continue to progress, we then go into Alzheimer's disease um, in which there's slow, cog um, gradual cognitive decline. Um, inability to do everyday living skills and behaviors that emerge. So we're going to be talking about some different parts of the brain as we go through this presentation. And so I just wanted to orientate you to a couple of the crucial areas. Um, so you're looking at the cartoon of the brain and you're sort of looking at it this way. And this is a plastic model, obviously. This is um, not a real brain, our brains are not this big. In fact, uh, the average brain is more about the size of a medium cauliflower that you could hold in the palm of your hand and it would probably weigh about two and a half to three pounds. But there's particular areas of the brain that we'll come back to. And one of those areas that really plays a very crucial role is this area that lies along your, the side of the head just a little bit above where your ears would be. And this is called the temporal lobes. And we have a left and a right temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe is this area here. And there's a particular structure within the middle portion of that temporal lobe called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is really the organ in the temporal lobe that is crucial for the formation of new memories, so learning and memory. And in Alzheimer's disease, some of the earliest changes are affecting the temporal lobe and the hippocampus. Hence, you get the severe memory impairment. Are there areas that gradually over time become affected are this area towards the back of the head, sort of behind the ears. This is called the parietal lobes, and the parietal lobes are involved in a lot of our language and visual spatial skills. And the disease will spread from the temporal area in the hippocampus into the parietal lobes and also into the frontal lobes, the area sort of behind your forehead, and that's involved in a lot of what are referred to as executive skills like judgment, problem solving, planning, multitasking, organization. So this is sort of the path that Alzheimer's disease takes, starting here and spreading outward until eventually most of the brain is affected. The changes that are really important, however, are not things that you can necessarily see with your eye, but rather they're microscopic changes and that's where we're going to look at a little bit fuller now. So there are at least 100 billion of these brain cells in each one of our brains, and each one of these neurons or brain cells has a cell body and an axon, 
and then many small little branches here called um, dendrites. And at the end of each one of these little branches um, <clears throat> is, uh, is a gap or a synapse uh, between it and the, the next uh, cell. And our memories and thoughts are sent like electrical charges down these branches and trigger the release of chemicals or neurotransmitters, we're going to talk about changes in neurotransmitters, that then transmit the message across this gap to the following cell. Now you can see as the slide notes, neurons or brain cells have three primary jobs and Alzheimer's disease disrupts the ability to, for the cells to communicate with each other interferes with me metabolism and also interferes with the cell's repair functions. So here you see uh, images of a normal, healthy brain. Looked a lot like that plastic one Malcolm held up. Um, and you can see that there are many hills and valleys in the brain and that these are nice and tightly compacted. Now this is the same kind of side view that Malcolm was showing you with the temporal lobe that's right over the ear. Now if you look at the person with Alzheimer's disease of a comparable age and their brain at death, you can see the significant atrophy or shrinkage that's occurred with these hills and valleys. They're all widening and opening up um, here in the temporal lobe and also in what's known as the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe of this brain. Now the microscopic changes, um, we're going to show a couple more slides of them, but here you see normal brain tissue um, at autopsy that's magnified, and here you see uh, Alzheimer's brain tissue. And there's two types of abnormal formations that occur in Alzheimer's disease. And the first one is uh, called senile plaques, and you can see right here um, the plaques. The plaques are composed of an abnormal protein called amyloid beta, and those <clears throat> that abnormal protein clumps around the cells. It looks kind of like a Brillo pad, and um, is involved in the death of the cell. The other pathological finding are called neurofibrillary tangles, and they show up as these sort of little flame-like images on the scan. And what they are is the, the plaques are occurring outside the cell and they're related to that <coughs> abnormal protein beta amyloid. The tangles are occurring within the cell, within the axon and the dendrites. And the, the cause of these tangles is, to believe, is believed to be another abnormal protein called tau, T-A-U. And if you were to magnify this axon, it doesn't, it's not just like a open tube, but rather what it's composed of is hundreds and hundreds of little tiny microtubules. And that is the next slide. These are just tiny little tubes it's sort of analogy would be you take a bundle of straws, hold them together. That's what you would see inside the axon. And the tau is essentially keeping these microtubules where we pass information up and down the cell nicely spaced and well structured. And so the microtubules and tau allow for some structure to the cells and also allow for it to maintain its integrity where it can pass information back and forth. Well, in Alzheimer's disease, this tau becomes abnormal. And you can think of the tau as sort of the, it's like a railroad track, where the tracks are the microtubules passing information up and down. And the tau are like the binds or the supports that keep the lines nicely aligned. In Alzheimer's disease, this process that it affects the tau 
essentially causes the microtubules or the ties to break apart. And just like in a railroad, if you didn't have the ties, the lines would get all twisted and tangled and information would no longer be able to flow back and forth. So what happens is as we develop Alzheimer's disease, we have both these abnormal formations of senile plaques, amyloid plaques outside the brain cell, and also within the cell, amyloid is forming, but also within the cell, these abnormal tau proteins are causing these microtubules to break apart and no longer be able to send information back and forth. Now, as we all age, even in a healthy brain, we will see some of these plaques develop. Usually there's not very many of these neurofibrillary tangles. Well, how does the process of Alzheimer's disease start? Well, this is still an area under investigation, but for many years, probably 30 plus years, the belief has that amyloid was the chief cause of the cognitive problems we see in Alzheimer's disease. And what happens is that we know that amyloid does occur in a healthy brain, but the healthy brain has mechanisms that allow it to sort of clear out this abnormal protein before it starts to really clump together into these plaques. In Alzheimer's disease, the brain is not very good at clearing out the amyloid. So the Alzheimer's brain shows a reduced clearance of amyloid, and as a result, scientists for decades focused on amyloid as the cause of Alzheimer's disease with the ideas if we could remove the amyloid and prevent it from occurring and forming these plaques, we would therefore prevent the disease from progressing. However, there's been some problems with that idea in the sense that there have been developed a number of experimental compounds in fact, the, there was a vaccine developed for Alzheimer's disease a number of years ago that actually showed you could remove some of those plaques from the brain. However, the unfortunate thing is that the disease continued to progress. So you could remove these sort of dead cells and the amyloid plaques, but the disease continued to progress. Also, places such as ourselves we have many of our uh, older adults who are part of our successful aging program, and a number of you are actually in, uh, I see some familiar faces from our program here, but when we look at their brain at autopsy, many of these individuals have extensive amyloid deposits in the brain, yet they're still functioning normally. They're doing all of their everyday activities without any problems. They're scoring in the normal range on memory tests. And the pathologist, who simply looks at the brain under a microscope, would come back and say, oh, this person looks like they have sort of classic Alzheimer's disease, and yet they're functioning normally. So there doesn't seem to be a close correlation between the presence of amyloid and the presence of dementia and cognitive difficulties. Also, the neurofibrillary tangles the distribution and number of them seems to correlate more with cognitive ability than does the distribution and amount of amyloid. So if you go to the next slide. So now I think there's been more and more attention towards this tau and the neurofibrillary tangles. And one view is that the tau may actually start to change before amyloid becomes an important function. So what happens is that it's possible that malfunctioning in the tau, this sort of breaking down of those railroad tracks, leads to the buildup of amyloid within the brain cell. And over time, there, this amyloid builds up in the cell and it sort of spills over into the gaps between the cells, and that's where you get your plaques. Other views say, well, the amyloid and, ta and uh, tau are equally important, and as they develop, you get sort of a, the combination of the two is causing this cell death. 
So I don't think science has yet sort of solved which is more important or which comes first, the tau or the amyloid, but both seem to be very important and so interventions would probably be wanted to address both abnormal proteins. And this will become very important when we come back later to some of the new therapies that are being worked on. Well, how can we measure, can we measure tau and amyloid in the brain of a living person? Not having to wait until they pass away where you look at the brain at autopsy and you stain it and it's frozen and sliced. Well, there are ways that you can look at amyloid and tau and one of the ways that is often used is through a three, um, a lumbar puncture or a cerebral spinal fluid analysis. And this is where the individual would probably be in a fetal position reclining and the physician would use a very fine almost hair-like needle and they would insert the needle between the vertebrae into this area where the spinal cord is and the spinal cord is surrounded by a fluid cerebral spinal fluid and cerebral spinal fluid has sort of the consistency of water and it's produced by an area right in the middle of the brain and it is sort of produced there and pumped into this cavity or ventricle and then the cavity has sort of exit routes where the fluid then flows down and around the spinal cord and around the brain and the spinal fluid is very helpful for sort of cushioning the brain and providing some support and structure. But as it goes around the brain, it sort of is washing the brain. And so it's picking up any abnormal proteins, the amyloid and the tau. And by withdrawing the fluid, you can get an indication of the levels of amyloid and tau in the spinal fluid. And this is what you typically would look for in someone with Alzheimer's disease. Um, I was just going to say that um, one of the things we want to do is thank everybody here who's donated CSF um, to um, the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center because it's enabling scientists to look at the levels of the abnormal proteins as Malcolm's going to be um, just mentioning here on this slide. So the amount of spinal fluid taken out is very small, a couple of little tablespoons full, and your brain very quickly replenishes it. And most often this procedure has very little in the way of any negative side effects. Probably the most common is if you were to get up quickly, you probably would develop a noticeable headache. And so after you've had the procedure, you just typically lie there for 40 minutes, an hour, and by then your brain will have essentially replenished that spinal fluid. But going back to what we look for, remember how I mentioned and Cordula mentioned that the amyloid is forming, it's staying in the brain, it's not being cleared out, and so it's sticking in the brain. And so what you find in, if you compare the amyloid levels in an Alzheimer's patient versus a normal adult, you find that there's not much amyloid in the spinal fluid. And that sort of sounds counterintuitive if the brain has got all of this amyloid in there and it's causing these cell death. But what's happening is the amyloid is sticking in the brain. It's not being washed out and that's why you see lower levels. Tau is representing that disintegration of the nerve cells and as the spinal fluid goes around it washes some of the remnants away with the tau and so you actually see an increased level in tau compared to normal adults. What is the level that should be seen in a person with Alzheimer's or MCI? We actually don't know. There's a lot of research directed at trying to find values. We have some idea, but to actually come up with values that would say, aha, this person is falling in the Alzheimer's range versus a normal adult or MCI. We don't really have that and that's where individuals who are contributing to the research will help to answer that question. So as I mentioned earlier, these changes, the amyloid and the tau abnormalities start in the temporal lobe and then they spread outwards into the parietal and frontal lobes. And eventually 
much of the brain is affected. The second way we can actually measure amyloid in the brain is by doing uh, an, what's called an amyloid PET scan. And this is not an evasive procedure where we withdraw fluid, but rather this is more similar to like an MRI or a PET scan where you're lying in a scanner, you're given an injection of a radioactive substance that will latch on to the amyloid in your brain. And this is an example of someone, an Alzheimer's patient. These are different perspectives. This one over here is a side view of the brain. This is the front and this is the back. And these bright colors, the reds and the yellows, those are representing deposits of amyloid. This is a normal adult and you can see very little red and bright yellow. So this normal adult isn't showing amyloid sticking in the brain and they don't show up on this amyloid PET or amavid scan. This is just looking at the brain from the top, so this is the front, this is the back, and you can see that this Alzheimer's patient has considerable amounts of amyloid in the temporal lobes along the side versus what you see in a normal <coughs> adult. So we can measure amyloid either through a scan, like an amavid scan, or through a CSF measure. So this particular slide illustrates for you when these various changes take place. So the horizontal axis represents time, um, passage of um, months and years, and the vertical axis represents how severe the cognitive impairment is with the top being the maximum. What's um, really interesting about this slide is that um, the green represents cognitive impairment. So th those are the initial clinical symptoms. When you start to recognize that you're having memory and thinking problems. When you uh, look at other changes, there are many other changes that occur, bio these biological markers that occur before you ever see cognitive changes. And so in particular, we wanted to point out that these changes in the CSF that Malcolm just described, and they're, rep they're represented by this purple lavender line. Look at, they're starting way out here, years and years before you ever see cognitive changes. Similarly, the accumulation of amyloid in the brain represented by this red line is starting years and years and uh, decades, often before you see the cognitive changes. And you can also see here that the blue, the tau, changes in tau start very, very early. So unfortunately, um, because we now uh, diagnose so late, it may be affecting our ability to treat um, the disease as effectively as we could, and we're going to talk about that. But even today, when people have very evident symptoms of memory and thinking difficulties, um, problems even taking care of themselves, doctors still fail to diagnose that the person has dementia. What this slide summarizes is that um, doctors miss 9 out of 10 people with very mild symptoms, and they even miss as many as um, 3 out of 4 that have more moderate to severe symptoms where the sy symptoms are obvious um, to the lay person. And as a result of that failure to diagnose individuals, many individuals don't receive the medications that we do have available today. And you can see um, a study that was done here that says only about 30 to 50 percent of people with Alzheimer's disease even have access to the medications we have today because of the delayed diagnosis. So this um, slide that's about primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment is going to be really important for understanding our treatments today and where we hope our treatments will go in the future. So um, we're going to start out here um, at the tertiary level. and. When we treat a disease when the symptoms are already present um, and the 
evident, such as in Alzheimer's disease, or such as when, in the example here, the person's already had a stroke and they're having cardiac rehab, that's tertiary uh, prevention. Secondary prevention involves when the person um, has the disease but there aren't any symptoms. So at, taking heart disease as an example, um, we know you are at risk for heart disease if you have high blood pressure or high cholesterol, so we treat those markers for heart disease. You don't have any symptoms yet. You haven't had a heart attack. You haven't had a stroke, but we're treating those risk factors. That's considered secondary prevention. Primary prevention is when we're talking to healthy people and teaching them lifestyle strategies, educating them about heart disease, and teaching them lifestyle strategies to prevent them from ever getting the disease, okay? So today, with Alzheimer's disease, we're out here. The treatments that we have today are treatments that are for people who already have symptoms um, and the disease is present. So here, this uh, slide ex exemplifies that. So in Alzheimer's disease, primary prevention would be if we could um, use either <coughs> medical or lifestyle strategies to prevent healthy people from ever getting the disease. So th these are healthy people. Secondary prevention would be if we had treatments or strategies that we could implement once we saw those biomarkers, once we saw the elevation of amyloid in the CSF or we picked it, uh, the elevation of tau, excuse me, and the decrease in amyloid in the CSF, or if we picked out amyloid in your brain through amyloid imaging, if we could give you some treatment, you already have the disease, we know that from the biomarkers, but if we could give you some treatment to either stop the disease, um, delay its onset, slow the progression, that would be secondary. And out here, when the person is already in dementia, full-blown dementia, where we have where we're at today um, with our treatment sets, tertiary prevention. Something that's really important to re remember, which uh, Dr. Pierre Terrio ter said um, many years ago now, is dementia may not be curable, but it is treatable even as in its advanced stages. So just because you can't cure something doesn't mean that you can't treat it. And we have many different ways that we can provide treatment to people with Alzheimer's disease. We have some pharmacological strategies, but we also have a lot of other tools in our tool belt that are psychosocial and behavioral interventions and family interventions that will help people with Alzheimer's disease. So we're going to talk now about the currently approved medications. And remember, this is tertiary prevention. These are people who already have the disease. What can we do for them today with medicine? So here's the history of um, medications in Alzheimer's disease. 1906 was when Dr. Alois Alzheimer's first identified Alzheimer's disease in Augusta Dieter a woman who was in her 50s, and he described the hallmark plaques and tangles that we showed you earlier. You'll notice that the first medication for Alzheimer's disease wasn't discovered till 1993. That's almost 90 years later before we discovered the first medication. Part of the reason for that was because um, early on, uh, doctors thought that Alzheimer's was a very rare disease. Augusta Dieter was only 51, so they thought this is an unusual um, case and doesn't occur often. Um, and actually, we found much later in the 1970s that much Alzheimer's disease was being misattributed to arteriosclerosis. So uh, between 1993 and 2003, um, there were a total of five medications developed for Alzheimer's disease. We no longer use Cognex because of the serious uh, side effects that we have. So today we're going to talk about the four medications we currently do use, three that are considered acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and the fourth, memantine, 
um, which regulates glutamate, and we'll be explaining how these medications work to you. So um, just um, to explain what these medications do in a general sense, this is just an illustration. Um, again, this is time, and this is level of impairment. So <clears throat> the natural course of Alzheimer's disease is just a slow and gradual um, decline. Now, if we, 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 we would hope that we could change the course of the disease with, well, we'd like to cure it. If we can't cure it, we'd like to prevent it. And if we can't prevent it, we'd certainly like to be able to um, change the course of the disease. So this green line represents changing the course of the disease, if we could actually change the slope of the disease. But um, our current medications don't do that. What they do is something we call having a symptomatic effect. And so that means that while you're on the medication, it boosts up your functioning, your ability. But once you're off the medication, which this uh, line represents, you drop down to where you would be without the medication. So our current medications are symptomatic. They can improve cognitive, behavioral, and, um, um, and uh, everyday living abilities, uh, but um, <laughs> they do not modify or change the course of the disease. So let's look at the first class of medicines. They're called acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And uh, these are a class of drugs that are working on a particular system in the brain called the cholinergic neurons system. And our brain has multiple transmitters. We've got transmitters that are involved in learning and memory, which is the acetylcholine system. There's also transmitters involved in sleep and in mood and in movement. But the ones that these drugs are all focusing are on this cholinergic system. And this has been an area of study probably for the last almost 40, 50 years. And the most important transmitter here is this one called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is that chemical messenger that allows one brain cell to send a message to another. It's released into the synapse, it floats across and hits the receptors. Now in Alzheimer's disease, there's many studies that show even in the early stages of the disease, there's a marked reduction. And as the disease progresses, the levels of acetylcholine become progressively more and more reduced because the cholinergic brain cells are dying away. So over time, you get less and less of this acetylcholine in your brain. There's another substance called butylcholinesterase. So you can use that next time you're playing Scrabble. <laughs> so butylcholinesterase, this is a substance that breaks down the chemical transmitter acetylcholine. And in a healthy brain, or in someone with just mild impairments, we have very little of this butylcholinesterase. But as the disease progresses, you get more and more of this substance that is actually getting rid of some of that acetylcholine. So as we get older, as, the, as Alzheimer's disease progresses, we get less and less acetylcholine, which is that necessary transmitter. We get more and more of this butylcholinesterase, which gets rid of that transmitter. Well, how do these drugs work? Well, you really only need to remember three things to understand how these drugs work. We have the acetylcholine, which are like these little red uh, bobs that sort of are jelly, jelly beans. Yeah. But they're released from this cell here. They float Just across. Just remember, jelly beans are floating across your synapse. <laughs> and so they send the message. There's this other substance called acetylcholine esterase. And think of the word esterase like the word eraser. And the acetylcholine esterase and the butylcholinesterase, they both sort of break down the acetylcholine. How do the drugs work? Well, what they do is they inhibit 
the eraser from working. So in other words, they stop the eraser from breaking down and getting rid of the acetylcholine. And some drugs work solely on acetylcholine esterase, and others work on both acetylcholine esterase and butylcholine esterase. So that's actually how they work. They prevent the eraser from functioning. The levels of acetylcholine are markedly reduced in different parts of the brain. We talked about the temporal lobe and hippocampus. This in yellow is the normal levels of acetylcholine. This is the levels you see in Alzheimer's disease patients and it's throughout the brain affecting the parietal lobes for visual, spatial, and language, and the frontal lobes for executive skills. All right, you have this handout. It's separate. It's probably on the back of your, um, uh, your packet. Um, and we're going to be going through the information on this handout in some of the upcoming slides, so I'm not going to talk about this particular slide um, right now, but I just wanted you to know you have um, a full page version of that handout so that you can um, read it. So we're going to talk first, as Malcolm said, about these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which are represented on this table. So we just want to mention that um, these medications, Alzheimer's disease affects three areas of functioning, and these medications can also impact three areas of functioning. Alzheimer's disease affects our memory and thinking abilities, our cognition. It also affects our ability to do our everyday living skills, so those activities of daily living, and it affects our behavior. So when we look at the impact of medications, we want to look at is it improving cognition? Is it improving the person's ability to function? Is it having a positive impact on the person's behavior? So when we look at cognition, how, how do we know that a drug is working to, say, improve memory or language or attention? Well, the FDA requires that all of these pharmaceutical makers or investigators developing drugs, they have to use a common tool so we can compare one drug, drug A, to drug B or to drug C. If investigators use different tests for every drug, it would be very hard to compare one to another. So the, the test that is used is called the Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale, and that's sort of the gold standard by the FDA for showing improvement in cognition. And the key thing to remember about these trials that we're going to show you in just a few minutes is that this is a test where, over time, an individual with Alzheimer's disease will show a decline in their performance, not unexpectedly. In this particular test, someone without any treatment, they typically show a seven to nine point drop in their score on this test over the course of a year. Many of the early clinical trials were about six months in duration, so you'd expect about a three to four point drop in scores on this test after six months in someone with Alzheimer's disease, okay? So for each one of these drugs, um, we have a summary slide, and the summary slide um, shows you what the initial starting dose would be. So here in the case of Denepazil or Aricept, you see it starts with five milligrams. Ideally, you would um, increase that to uh, 10 milligrams, and then if it's appropriate, in moderate to severe dementia, up to 23 milligrams. You see the titration interval. That means how quickly do you go from a low dose to a uh, high dose of the drug. And here in the case of um, from 5 to 10 milligram tablet of Aricept, you would take from 4 to 6 weeks to make that increase. And then for uh, 23 milligrams, 3 months. And it also shows the mechanism of action, which in this case is it's um, inhibiting that eraser, that acetylcholinesterase. Now, we have uh, about three slides which we're going to show to illustrate these drugs. 
And there could have been many other slides that we chose, but we just chose these three because they were part of the studies that helped to convince the FDA that these drugs were worthwhile in uh, approving for general use. But this is an example of a study with Aricept. And these studies are what are called randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled meaning that subjects with Alzheimer's disease are randomly assigned to either a treatment group or a placebo group where they get sort of an inactive sugar pill. Double blind means that the investigators who are doing the testing, they have no idea whether the person is getting the treatment or the placebo. This is an example where this is the score on that cognitive scale, the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale. And these are three groups. This is a group in yellow showing the, getting a high level of the dose. This is the beginning dose in green. And the yellow and the red triangles are people in the placebo group. And this is the duration of this trial that goes to about 26 weeks, about six months. And what you find is that the placebo group, everybody starts out about the same on this test. The placebo group shows a progressive decline of about two to three points after six months. The treatment groups, particularly the high dose groups, they show actually no change from their baseline. So in other words, they remained relatively stable. The, the higher the dose was better than the lower dose, but both groups showed improvement. This blue bar is where the drug was stopped. They stopped the drug, and what you see, as Cordula mentioned a few minutes ago, is, is within about four weeks, everybody was sort of at where they normally would be. So this produced a symptomatic improvement in scores. So now we're moving on to rivastigmine or Exelon, so you can see this particular medication comes in a capsule form or in a skin patch. Um, and again, it was a starting dose of um, 3 milligrams, um, eventually up to 12 milligrams, titrated over four weeks, and taken with food or in the skin patch, um, which starts at 4.6 milligrams and uh, can go up to 13.3 milligrams. And Again, this is a capsule. At the bottom of that slide, it shows that oh, sorry. Yeah. Novartis, who makes Exelon, they said that, well, their drug is better than Aricept because their drug affects both acetylcholine esterase as well as butylcholine esterase. And there may be some value in that, and particularly in the later stages where, as we know, butylcholine esterase increases rather markedly. What is the data? Oh, uh, this is showing um, a cartoon where one of the reasons the patch actually has much fewer side effects, which we'll show you in a minute, than does the pill form. And the patch, however, does have the side effect where it can cause skin irritation. The patch itself is about the size of a half dollar band-aid and you put the patch on, it's a 24 hour patch. You typically want to move the location of the patch. You put it on your shoulders, your chest, your back. You put it up sort of on the upper chest and back and you want to move the patch around over the course of a two week period where you don't go into the same location. It's similar as if you wear a Band-Aid and you put the Band-Aid on the same location day after day after day, the adhesive is going to irritate the skin. So this is just an illustration showing moving the patch. This is an illustration of the drug trial with Exelon. And uh, as we had in the earlier study, here we've got high dose of Exelon, low dose, and a placebo group. And you can see, compared to the placebo group who showed a decline over the course of the study, the high treatment group actually remained stable. What's interesting about this study is that after 26 weeks, everybody was put on to the drug. So the people who were given the sugar pill, they were now given the medication. This is what you would expect to see if the people continued on the placebo. This is sort of 
uh, the expected placebo decline, and you can see after 52 weeks, it's about a seven to nine point drop, which is what we talked about earlier. The interesting point here is that while the placebo group who were put on the medication showed some improvement, they never really reached the same level as what you saw for people who started the dose at the very beginning. In fact, the people who started the dose early, after a year, their average decline was only about two or three points compared to the average decline that we'd expect about seven to nine. So the take home message here is that it's better to start early than late because if you start late, you may not be able to reach the same level as you would if you started the medicines earlier. All right, in the interest of time, because it's five to six, I'm not gonna read through all of this. I think I've shown you how to read these um, slides, um, but this particular drug, galantamine, which does come in a immediate release or extended release form, uh, inhibits acetylcholinesterase, but it also stimulates nicotinic receptors to release more acetylcholine into the synapse. And this is another illustration just showing the data from galantamine, and this is a long-term study. It went out three years. And you can see the high-dose group, after, a year, after 12 months, they were doing much better than the placebo group. But what's important to notice is this is what you would expect if you just continued out the placebo group for three years. It'd be about a 21-point drop on this test that people who actually continued with the drug, they showed about a seven to nine point drop after three years, which is what you would expect after one year. So in fact, they were about 50% better than what you would expect. So that tells you that these drugs do have long lasting benefits and that you can see benefits, even 50% improvement, even after three or more years on the medicine. All of the drugs work about the same. This yellow bar is showing roughly about the level of improvement you see across multiple trials compared to the red bar, which is a placebo group. There's not really much evidence saying one drug is, quote, better than the other. They're all producing relatively similar benefits. Now, which drug do you choose? Well, that's going to be based on your conversation with your physician who will look at your medical history. For example, people who have had problems with sort of a regular or a slow heartbeat, they may, you may wanna be cautious about giving any of these drugs. If you've had a stomach ulcer or um, you're an intestinal ulcer, these drugs all sort of increase stomach acid secretion. So if you've had an ulcer before, you may want to be cautious about using these medicines. Uh, there are certain things that you might choose. So for example, if a person has liver problems or liver cirrhosis, you may not want to use Aricept. You might want to choose one of these other two drugs. Or if you've got kidney problems, you may want to use Aricept versus the other two. But this is something that you and your doctor would need to decide based on your medical history. So what about side effects? So this slide shows you that the primary side effects that the acetylcholinesterase have are gastrointestinal side effects. So primarily you're going to see issues with nausea. Um, here again, comparing side effects in a placebo group versus those on the medication. So primarily with nausea, also some with vomiting. Um, and with diarrhea. Um, the Exelon patch actually has the least gastrointestinal side effects and is a good option for someone who's having a hard time um, with the tablet or capsule form of these medications. Generally, as Cordula just said, the most common side effects with these drugs are gastrointestinal side effects. And how can we sort of minimize them? Well. One of the ways to do it is to often give the medication with food. 
Another probably better way is to slowly give the drug. So you start out at the lowest dose and over a number of weeks you increase it to the maximum dose. Okay. This is just a table showing if you go from, this is with Aricept, if you go from the low dose to the high dose within seven days, about 21% of individuals will show problems with nausea and about 16% with diarrhea. So this is if you go from low to high within a week. If you spread that out and you go from the low dose to the high dose within a month, you have the side effect profiles. So by simply going slow, you can actually make the drugs much more tolerable. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so you can see, um, because of the side effects, unfortunately about 50% of people with Alzheimer's disease stop the drug. Um, and as Malcolm already said, there are several good ways to minimize the side effects um, and get the person up to the highest dose possible. You saw on the slide that the higher the dose, the more effective the drug was. So we want to get the person up to the highest possible dose. And um, uh, discontinuation is something you would consider if the side effects are really persisting, even at the low dose. Um, you're seeing accelerated decline after a six-month trial, and you do want to do a six-month trial, or there's a change in the risk-benefit. So how about switching? Well, actually, switching, don't make the assumption that if your loved one had side effects or um, was nauseous or vomiting in response to Aricept, that means that they're also going to be nauseated or vomiting if they take um, the other acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Um, you can see that 50 percent of patients who didn't respond well to the first drug responded well to another drug. So, um, and uh, let me see. Oh, if there are side effects and um, it's, uh, the drug's not well tolerated before you start a new drug, you usually want a washout period of about a week. So now we're going to talk about Nemenda. Nemenda is, uh, works in a different way than the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and here's your summary slide on that. Um, Nemenda actually comes in two forms. It's immediate release and extended release, um, and you can see the uh, various uh, indications there in terms of initial and maximum doses for those uh, two forms of uh, Nemenda. What's really interesting uh, is if you've been paying any attention to uh, Alzheimer's disease medications on the news lately, there was um, actually um, a court case over Nemenda because activists the company that produces Nemenda is just going to be um, uh, offering or beginning to offer the extended release version of Nemenda. So uh, they decided they would uh, pull the immediate release version off. Well, the immediate release version is scheduled to go generic um, in July of this year. If the, if the drug goes generic, then the cost actually drops by um, 30 to 50 percent actually be anticipated by early next year the cost would um, drop by about 90 percent and so um, thankfully uh, just this last month in May um, New York Appeals Court in New York ruled that activists cannot withdraw the immediate release form uh, of Nemenda so Nemenda is going to be uh, much more accessible at a lower cost um, to families um, just so that they can sell the more expensive uh, patented uh, extended release form. So that was a win for families. Nemenda, uh, as I said, works in a different way. It regulates another neurotransmitter um, called glutamate. So glutamate is sort of an excitatory transmitter in the brain. It helps to get your brain cells active. And in Alzheimer's disease, most often what happens is that people have too much of this transmitter. And when you have too much of it, it's like your cells, your brain is in overdrive. 
and your cells sort of burn themselves out. It's called neurotoxicity. So what Namenda does is if you've got too much of this glutamate, it will actually lower it to a safe level for your brain. And in, by doing that, Namenda is believed to have sort of, quote, a protective effect. It helps your, to maintain those brain cells, keep them healthy. This is just some quick data to show the benefits. These are like the other studies, they go for about six months, and this is looking at a score on a cognitive test for patients who are really quite advanced. These are all patients with, if you know the test, it's a mini mental state exam, it's scores of 10 or below. These are where the individual would not be doing any of their instrumental activities like shopping or driving or meal preparation. They'd just be doing very basic activities and many of them would need assistance with that. So this is a group of patients giving the Menda versus a placebo and you can see there's a significant difference between the treatment groups. This is looking at the same kind of data but now we're looking at an activities of daily living scale and this is the placebo group and we can see a decline over the six months and we see less decline in the treatment group with Namenda. So sometimes what's really important to families is how well that person is functioning. So this is some interesting additional data. And <clears throat> you can see um, the blue represents the decline in these various functions in the placebo group versus the decline with Namenda. And you can see that definitely on Namenda, the person was doing better with going outside the home, um, using the telephone, doing simple things like clearing the table. And in fact, they actually improved relative to the placebo group on being in a conversation. And one of the things caregivers say is the hardest is the um, loss of the ability to communicate with a loved one. So just a simple improvement of being able to communicate a little bit better with a caregiver can be so meaningful. Well, as we've mentioned, Namenda is working on a transmitter glutamate. Aricept, Exelon, and Razodyne, they're all working on acetylcholine, so two different transmitters. Well, you can actually give the two drugs together. And these are some studies that have looked at the benefit of individuals who were given both Namenda plus Aricept versus just Aricept alone. In fact, these were advanced patients. There were about 400 of them and they divided them into two groups. One who got both drugs, one who just kept with the Aricept. These patients had been on Aricept for two or more years. And what you see is that this is a group given both drugs together. After six months, essentially no change in their scores and their cognitive abilities. This is the decline seen in just Aricept. Now, a few slides back, we won't go back, but if you just scanned back a few slides, you could compare that to the group who were just given the placebo of nothing. And in that group, there was about a 10-point drop after six months. So what this tells us is that Aricept by itself leads to an improvement compared to no treatment but the combination of the two actually gives you better performance than Aricept alone. The same thing is true here, where this is given Aricept plus Namenda. This is just Aricept alone, and if you went back a few slides and looked at the activity of daily living scale, you would see that it had dropped about six points in the, the non-treatment group. So once again, whether it's dealing with cognition or everyday activities, the combination of a cholinesterase inhibitor plus Namenda was superior to just the cholinesterase inhibitor by itself. So what about side effects? Well, this slide basically shows you that Namenda does not have the GI side effects that, um, that um, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors have. In fact, when you look at the side effects, experienced by placebo and people with memantine, the percentages are very comparable. So very few side effects and actually sometimes 
when the drugs are taken together. Nemenda also helps to calm down the side effects of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So, um, so uh, the reason we give these drugs together, as this uh, slide summarizes, is because they do work differently, so they can be taken together. Um, and, you know, you've seen the benefits um, but for people with Alzheimer's disease, but Namenda doesn't benefit people with MCI or with um, mild dementia. So um, here's just some um, points about these drugs. First of all, you have to understand that the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease aren't a part of normal aging, and um, you also have to understand that there are things that we can do. So we really want to get away from this feeling that, um, you know, if someone gets the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, um, it's a hopeless situation because it really is not. There is a lot that can be done for the person, including these medications, as um, we've discussed. We've made some main points about, you know, starting treatment earlier is better. Giving the highest dose possible is good. Um, and that actually benefits can be quite long lasting, up to three years. Um, and that there are ways to minimize some of the um, side effects. So we have to be realistic, though, and sometimes um, when a person receives a diagnosis and the family receives that diagnosis, they are looking for that cure, they're looking for that magic pill, and come to taking these medications with unrealistic expectations. So. We want families to focus on um, the fact that these medications can help boost functioning. They are not a cure. They're not going to change the course of the disease, but they can help the person be the best that they can be. They can help improve the quality of life. Um, and certainly, most importantly here, um, we need to recognize that no change is actually, um, is actually um, beneficial. It actually means that these medications are helping. Because as you saw on the slides, um, these medications boosted functioning, um, and so it didn't bring the person back up to normal. It boosted their functioning. So if they're not changing and they're not declining, it means the drug is working. Well, one of the added benefits, we've talked about how these drugs can boost up cognition and also how they can help with everyday functioning. Well, one of the added benefits is that we also know that these drugs can, in certain situations, be helpful for managing mood and behavioral problems. And the cholinesterase inhibitors, the Aricept, Exelon, Razadine, they can often help with certain mood problems like apathy, depression, anxiety, uh, sort of uh, restless behavior, pacing, uh, fidgeting. The Nemenda is actually very helpful for managing certain behavioral problems like agitation and irritability. And in fact, some studies have shown that patients who are put on Nemenda before these symptoms occur, they may actually have less likelihood of showing problems with agitation and irritability. So it may sort of um, cut, cut it off before they actually occur. So these are the recommended drugs. Go ahead to the next slide. Yes. So for mild to moderate Alzheimer's, the FDA has approved Razadine and Exelon. For mild to severe Alzheimer's, the FDA has approved Aricept. Moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, the FDA has approved Namenda. So these are the current four drugs that are FDA approved that we use with patients from mild to severe Alzheimer's disease. So remember we talked about um, mild cognitive impairment at the beginning. That mild cognitive impairment is a transitional stage between what we consider normal cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease. Well, would these drugs benefit someone that has mild cognitive impairment? Well, um, the findings have not been too hopeful in that regard. 
There was a Cochrane review that looked at nine studies that investigated the benefits of the existing medications, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, for people with MCI. And basically, um, there was no significant improvement um, for people with MCI. Um, about a third of the patients showed a positive response, but most showed only very minimal benefit. And most importantly, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors didn't slow conversion to dementia. So it didn't stop the person from um, progressing. And um, the side effects were worse. One of the very first studies that was done, it, it, it was done in 2005 with MCI and the belief was that at that time uh, the Aricept might help prevent the MCI patients from converting to dementia. And they compared high doses of vitamin E, which was thought to help protect the brain, to Aricept to placebo. And they followed these individuals over the course of three years. And they looked to see, would they go from MCI to dementia? And the first chart, the first graph line, this shows what happens with people who are not on anything. So these are the MCI patients. This is the probability of not converting to dementia or remaining MCI. You can see that after about three years, almost 50% had converted to dementia. This is what happens with the vitamin E. Essentially no difference. And this next chart is the Aricept. And Aricept actually did show a benefit. It was about a 50% reduction on the first year and about a 36 or so per reduction in the risk of developing dementia by the second year, but by the third year there was no real benefit. So the Aricept, it didn't prevent a conversion, but what it did is sort of delayed it, pushed it back by a small amount. An interesting study that was just released, they were looking at, well, are there other benefits? We know that they don't really improve cognition in MCI and they didn't prevent conversion to dementia. So this was a study actually looking at whether there were some structural benefits. It was just released uh, about a month or so ago, a couple of months ago. And what they did is they were looking at atrophy in the, in the hippocampus, which is this area here, this sort of like little seahorse or S-shaped structure. And the hippocampus is that part of the brain that's involved in encoding and storing information in the temporal lobes. And these are just some slides of Alzheimer's patients going from the normal to the mild to the moderate and the very severe where there's a lot of atrophy and shrinkage in the temporal lobe and hippocampus. And this particular study with MCI, they sort of followed people with MCI over 12 months where they gave a scan, an MRI scan at the beginning and at the 12 month period. And they had half the people were taking Aricept and the other half were on just placebo. And what they found is that the group given the Aricept showed a 45% reduction in shrinkage in the hippocampus over the course of the year. So there wasn't any difference in their cognitive performance, but they showed less atrophy in the hippocampus. And so that suggests maybe these drugs were actually producing more than just a symptom symptomatic benefit. Maybe there was some structural changes as well. So are there any other treatment options for people with MCI? Malcolm's going to talk about. When we talk in November about ways to help protect your brain, one of the things we do with MCI is we want to try to make sure there's no contributing factors like vascular disease that would uh, affect their performance and make things worse. But one of the things that we all look at is looking at their medications. So one of the drugs when you look at the medications an individual's on, one of the drugs you need to look at is some of the over-the-counter drugs. And there's a class of drugs that are over-the-counter, meaning they don't require a prescription, and these are called anticholinergic drugs. They're very common. They're often used for treating like uh, hay fever, colds, they're the antihistamines, also they're um, antacids, 
um, um, ones that help control bladder function, those are all anticholinergic. Um, they can have various side effects, and one of the side effects that you see when people take the drug are cognitive difficulties, so problems with memory, attention, concentration, speed of thinking. Just recently, there was a study released that looked at individuals, healthy individuals who were taking anticholinergic medications on a regular basis, which is very common in older adults, and they looked at the risk for developing dementia. And what they found is that they were tracking about 3,400 individuals over seven years. These were all healthy individuals to begin with, and about 800 developed dementia during the course of the seven years. And what they found is that even low doses of certain anticholinergic drugs given on a regular basis which is often the case, that did increase the risk for developing dementia. So they found like, for example, that four milligrams daily of Benadryl would increase over the long term, taking that many, a, long, a lot, would increase the risk of dementia. Now I looked on the web to see how much essentially Benadryl is in these three very common medications, and the average dose has about 25 to 50 milligrams. So if you're taking one of these anticholinergic drugs, you should really probably talk with your doctor and determine is there something else that you can take. We just had an example this week in our clinic of a patient who has problems with arthritis, and so for the last three or four years, they've been taking Tylenol PM. Uh, the individual also has some memory and thinking problems. The doctor could probably work with that individual, so they asked, why are you taking the PM version? And it just says, well, because of the arthritis, I sleep better. But you might be able to get, say, regular Tylenol and maybe take a supplement, a natural supplement like melatonin, and maybe that could help you sleep and you won't have the negative side effects of the Benadryl, the anticholinergic. So you don't stop these drugs right off. You need to work with your doctor to titrate off of them, but maybe look for substitutes that won't have an increased risk of causing dementia. So that we can get to the new medications, because we have such little time, I just want to mention that uh, two very effective treatments for people with MCI are physical activity and I picked out this particular study because in this study they actually showed that regular physical activity and the pictures illustrate what they were talking about. Playing sports, gardening, traveling, or walking. Were, um, individuals who were doing those activities, a high level of those activities were 64% less likely to develop a dementia. And just wanted to also mention how important it is to stay um, cognitively active. And there are many, many studies that show that cognitive stimu stimulation activity, challenging your brain, can improve your overall cognitive functioning and uh, help specific abilities, as well as just help you feel better about yourself, help you feel like you're doing something to improve your memory. So now we're going to touch briefly on new um, medications. We've already talked about um, the fact that some medications only have a symptomatic benefit and what we're really wanting to do is to um, either slow the progression, um, modify, modify the disease, um, and ultimately cure it. So there are many ways that new medications are trying to address Alzheimer's disease and from the earlier in the lecture you certainly understand that one important function that these new medications are trying to do is to clear that amyloid from the brain and to stop the clumping of the amyloid fragments into, um, into the um, senile plaques as well as um, dissolving the, the, ta the tangles of the tau protein, um, reversing cell death using things like uh, nerve growth factor, reducing inflammation, and oxidative stress. So there's been a lot of clinical trials. 
this, this chart sort of essentially says that since as of 2014, 244 different compounds have been tried in over 400 clinical trials and the failure rate is about 99.6%. So that sounds very negative and we've listed a couple of the very trials that had received a lot of attention in the press that everybody thought were going to be sort of wonder drugs but they didn't turn out that way. So this isn't, doesn't necessarily mean there's a lot of negatives because almost all of these clinical trials were learning things and one of the things that have been learned is that probably what's happening is we're starting these clinical trials too late. Many of the clinical trials that we've just shown you were dealing with patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease and when you get into that stage you've already had the disease for probably 20 years. So what you need to do is move forward into that preclinical and MCI stages. Malcolm's already made that point about um, moving forward so we can just pass on these slides um, that we want to move back into treating in the preclinical stages. So um, go ahead. So I mean it's the, anal the analogy would be if you wanted to treat somebody say with heart disease you wouldn't wait until they've already had multiple strokes and multiple heart attacks and have all of these stents put in to clear blocked arteries. You would want to treat them when they're much less impaired. So uh, we're just going to end with these last three studies that look at various antibodies. And one of them that was just discussed in March earlier this year by Biogen is uh, what is called a monoclonal antibody drug. Uh, and this is very positive because what this drug showed that it would not only remove the amyloid from the brain but on cognitive tests so the amyloid was removed based on amyloid imaging where the people who had the scan who had the drug showed much less amyloid in their brain after being on the drug for a year than those who were not on the drug and they also more positively they showed improvement in cognitive performance. The second trial which I want to talk about is one that has been ongoing for probably the last year and a half or more and this is using another monoclonal antibody. Uh, this is where you get an IV infusion roughly once a month of this drug. It's called solanusabab. And this is called Expedition 3 and what it is looking at is looking at individuals who have mild Alzheimer's disease. They're getting this infusion of this essentially antibody once a month and they're being tracked over this extended period of time, essentially 18 months and half the people are getting the antibody, half are getting just a placebo. And what they're looking at is they're looking at to see whether or not this antibody would remove the amyloid from the brain, thereby keeping the person at a higher level of functioning. This is Expedition 3. There was an Expedition 1 and 2. Expedition 2 used patients who had mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease. They didn't see any benefit of solanusabab in the moderate, but they did see a 37 percent slowing of the disease in those who have mild. And so Expedition 3 is just looking at mild cases with the hope that those people who are given the medication they would show a slower progression of the disease. The last study, you may have actually heard about this, this is a study that we're also involved in, we're also doing the Expedition 3, but this is called the A4 study. And this is really novel. It's, it's sort of unique in the area of clinical trials because this is, I believe, the world's first essentially preventative trial. It's that secondary treatment where what we're doing, and this is a study that's taking place in Canada, the U.S., and Australia. They're looking to recruit a thousand normal adults who have amyloid in their brain. UCI is looking to recruit 30 individuals, but these are individuals who are normal. They aren't showing any significant cognitive deficits. 
but if you were to give them the amyloid PET scan, you would see amyloid starting in their brain. They will be given the infusion once a month. It's a three-year study. Half the people will get the infusion of solanusabab. The other half will get just a placebo. They'll be tracking them in terms of the amyloid levels in the brain and also their cognitive performance. And the goal is that these individuals who are essentially normal or in the preclinical phase where the pathology is present in the brain but it's not producing any symptoms, that hopefully we might be able to prevent them from progressing into MCI and then into dementia by sort of clearing out that amyloid at a very early stage before any damage or before the real pathology has occurred. So we do have um, our, our clinical trials individual is not here tonight, but if you're interested in any of these clinical trials, and we've only mentioned a couple, but we have other ones that are looking at interventions. We have one that will hopefully will start looking at the benefit of exercise in people who are not traditionally high exercisers. So sort of the average older adult with MCI who's not a big exerciser to see if regular exercise would help to protect their brain and maybe keep them at the MCI level. All right, we're going to stop out of respect for time, for everybody's time, and we're just going to be here for a little while. If anybody has any questions or want to chat, please feel free to do that. Thank you so much.